Hi, nice to be among you all. It's interesting that so many of you have already dealt with this topic in your own ways. And I'm going to take a slightly different approach to the bureaucratic mind relating it to the potential effects, negative effects on physiologic health. And so our institute, the Institute for Therapeutic Discovery, we're in Richmond, Virginia, plus Albany, New York with John McMichael. We're interested in such things as energy medicine, the Bankston Healing Project, and the placebo response. Now, when we're talking about the bureaucratic mind, we're talking about pervasive connections throughout daily life. It is defined here as a dynamic speaking to how we organize perception and subsequently behave. And so if we try to, it's characterized by status quo, stereotypical points of view, condensed thinking. Um, it's hard to get a metric on this, so like, even if it's a questionnaire, because by designing that questionnaire, by posing those problems of, with a profile you're seeking to elicit, you're actually defining the bureaucratic mind, and so you're producing a bureaucratic situation, and so you've obviated what the heck you're trying to look at in the first place. It's enhanced and promulgated by education and education of all kinds, and it's upheld by authority of all kinds. And so we'll get into universal fallacies of logic in just a little bit. So the characteristics of maintenance of a prefabricated mindset for the sole purpose of maintaining that specific mindset. So it's rather incestuous in that regard. It includes categorical thinking and categorical behavior. And those branch all disciplines. For example, in politics, global warming does not occur. That's one example of it. In philosophy, a material-based world is projected on to materialism definition of uh, the philosophy. In science, the findings of science aren't used. They're used to form a bureaucratic mindset rather than to advance science itself as a methodology of learning. And in the corporate, the free market rules. And in religion, evolution does not occur. And in fairness, one might say another bureaucratic uh, consideration would be saying that intelligent design is a bunch of hogwash. So there's a flip. And one could make the point that each and every one of these characteristics is political by nature because it involves humans coming together and struggling among themselves to see which point of view will arrive at a consensual agreement. And that consensus is a hallmark of what we're dealing with here today as the bureaucratic mind. Now, it has benefits. Societies, institutions, organizations are built on bureaucracy. So I'm not trying to throw anything out the window here. I'm just trying to gain an understanding and appreciation of the entire dynamic. And so you have order, purpose, and meaning. A worldview provides a world to view. And it gives you a nation of laws that prevent anarchy and chaos. There's no Mad Max scenario if you have a coherent society. It gives you certain standards. So no matter where in the world that you buy a music CD, you're going to be able to go home and play that music CD in whatever um, technology you have at home. Airline safety regulations. And if you're on the road, and you, let's just say your favorite rest, one of your favorite restaurants at home is Ruby Tuesdays, and you're 3,000 miles away and there's a Ruby Tuesday, the odds are you're going to get a meal that you can pretty much enjoy because it's going to be comparable to the one at home. So bureaucracy gives us all of those things. It gives us the logistics to hold a conference, both on a general level and for the individual getting here. The drawbacks, philosophical. Conditioning thinking is held as the final reality. And so you're, again, you're going to try to maintain that mindset and squash any of the opposition trying to change that particular mindset. The fallacies of logic are universal. It violates universal fallacies of logic, two of them being, like, say, the bandwagon effect. You say something is true just because everybody in your discipline or everybody in your circle of influence says it's true. And in terms of authority, if a medical doctor says something or if a professor says something or an educator says something, then that is true because that person, that authority figure, said it was true and it's held as true. 
That's a violation of universal, that's a universal fallacy of logic. Now, when we get in the legal morass, that influences everything at well. So a physician is more, physicians are becoming more concerned about being sued rather than the practice, the art and practice, the art and craft of their practice. And so they will prescribe, they will overprescribe, they'll do anything to remove any hint of litigation. And I'm not saying every physician has this. I'm just trying to get some principles established. And so in public education, the curriculum is decided by governmental bodies that have their own set of rules, regulations, and laws. All that comes together to form a coherent mindset, but that coherent mindset typically goes unchallenged for a period of time. It's deferred to as its own authority. It has its own life that tries to maintain itself. And so upon graduation, you end up in this scenario. Now the causes, it's a natural, this is a natural effect of psychological closure. So for example, if you take a paragraph out of your favorite book and you, eliminate, you white out one word and you read that, odds are most people are going to fill in that blank space. They're not going to see the blank spot there. It's a natural property and it's universal. And what it does is it constricts awareness. Survival, membership, and belonging. I'm a personal fan of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, refer to it constantly. So in the deficit needs, you have things such as survival. You need to eat. You need to find shelter. There's a sense of belongingness that's part of the deficit needs. Now, it's not when you get into your growth needs, it's not that you get rid of your deficit needs. You need to continue to eat. Most people do anyway. The idea is you can suspend that drive to fulfill those needs in favor of growth, advanced learning, and a completely new sense of the, word, uh, the world. And what's really interesting is Maslow gets into an ontological state of consciousness defined as being. There's many different terms for ontology. Here, I'm going to approach it as a state of beingness, which is inherently beyond the bureaucratic mind, because it does not support any other mindset, it supports qualities of consciousness. A bureaucratic mind hinders individuation, which is this process of going through deficit to growth needs that Maslow outlines. The interesting thing about the individuated person is that individuated person is fully functional within society. They do not become an outcast. They do not position themselves above the crowd. They are fully integrated but they have their own sense of where they are, their own sense of purpose and meaning, their own direction in life, and they figure out a way to make that of value to society at large. So it's a really interesting dynamic. Another one person right, an article I just recently read, he makes the point we have simply become habituated to bureaucratic life. And that's the way it is, and nobody um, overstatement challenges it. And so we're caught in a vice. Now here's the suggestion. An overly conditioned mindset produces undue stress. And that constriction renders homeodynamics out of whack. So from a being perspective, an ontological perspective, being is a psychological state of homeodynamics. Homeodynamics being another, a more descriptive word of homeostasis. And so if the body is fully functioning, it is in a state of being. Physiologic homeodynamics correlates with psychological homeodynamics. So homeodynamics defined is a natural state evidenced by health, psychological and physiological. It is a complex, it's dynamic, it has multiple feedback systems, an array of feedback systems that maintain that really intricate dance of balance. It's a complexity-based equilibrium. So even though given its complex nature, when you're talking about complexity, you're talking about different systems talking and dancing among each other. So that complex arrangement goes into a state of complexity where all these feedback systems, the regulatory systems, they communicate to one another, they bounce off one another, and the end result is physiologic equilibrium that's always never in a state of rest. 
So now to tackle that, let's talk a little bit about the epigenome. Epigenomic research is relatively new. Um, it deals with these pieces surrounding and influencing DNA. The aspects of them are DNA methylation, which is carbon groups attaching directly to DNA, histone proteins, and I'll give you a graphic of that in just a second, chromatin, which is like condensed histone proteins, and non-coding RNA. Non-coding RNA is probably the least investigated to date, and, so, and it's, I don't even want to go there because I'm going to say something wrong. Now, each of these influences the others, and here's a general view of it. So you go from uh, DNA, you, I'll give you an image on methylation in a second. Histones form, and they get tighter and tighter and tighter until they form chromatin structures. It gets tighter and tighter and tighter. It's, a protect, it's previously thought to be a protective influence of DNA to form the chromosome. And again, the, over here, you go through the sequence of histone proteins condensing from a chromatin and uh, protects the chromosome. That thinking and the idea that DNA is mechanistic, that is the structure of DNA, the coding of DNA produces the proteins and produces everything about you, that thinking is going out the window quite rapidly. The idea being that this epigenome it is an ex of the proteins, there's eight different kinds of, uh, whoops, excuse me, uh, histone molecules. They form a nucleosome. This is an image of the DNA wrapping in and around it. It also has histone tails, of which nobody knows too much about those yet. Uh, they are made up of the same type of protein, but they're different sizes. My conjecture is that they serve as antennas. Antennae, excuse me. And so they form, they get tighter and tighter, and they form a chromatin structure. And the chromatin has its own form, histone methylation, all these influences, all driven by enzymes. Uh, there's, at an embryonic level, the methylation, for example, is completely stripped. It's demethylated, and then it's remethylated for cell differentiation. A little bit later, methylation is completely stripped again. It's remethylated for gender differentiation. And it's always at the CG base. The interesting thing about it is they know now DNA methylation is the best characterized part of the, of the epigenome to date. It's responsible for cellular memory processes, and it's heritable. And so one of the interesting things about it is that they've tracked it down to the F5 generation now. They know it's gone at least five generations. Now, environmental toxins produce epimutations. And so this is an example of an epimutation down here. It's just an irregular form on the pattern on a DNA methylation island. And that aberration influences genetic expression, the expression of DNA. So all of these work together and they form the entire epigenome, forms a regulatory influence of what the DNA will be expressed without altering DNA structure. And so it's, it's um, turning everything on its ear in uh, research in this regard. So it just turns off the wrong genes, turns on this and that. It's attributed to cancer, obesity, for example. A person can be morbidly obese, diet and exercise won't do a darn thing, and the reason that person is obese is because they have an aberrant methylation pattern, plain and simple. One researcher I talked to attributes all diseases, except for, for injury-related diseases and infectious diseases, attributes all other diseases to aberrant methylation or epigenomic aberrations. Now here, in terms of this talk, evidence indicates that psychosocial conditions can produce the stress that acts in the same way as an environmental toxin, like an environmental poison. Exhaust fumes produce rapid changes in methylation patterns. And so we're not talking about the occasional fight. We're talking about a person being in a stressful, ongoing situation that could produce an epimutation, which will affect health. Now let's 
shift gears and come at it from slightly different angles using the same thing, a mindset affecting health, and we'll go into the placebo response. Defined as a psychological component delivering a therapeutic effect beyond natural history and spontaneous regression. It is a restoration of homeodynamics. It's the same dynamics pertain to a nocebo response where all these, some condition produces a state of ill health or a state of disease. Placebo and no responses stem from active psychosocial processes such as con uh, conditioning and expectation. Some form of learning and education goes into producing those states of expectancy or those states of conditioning. And they're, as well as being mediated by so psychosocial conditions, they're modulated by states of learning and education. And so it, it affects internal and external environments where there are psychological conditions and there could be the plaques on the wall which brings us back to authority. So if you're in a doctor's office and they're getting more adept on employing the placebo response as a mode of therapy now, the plaques on the wall could very well support and help that physician bring his authority, his or her authority to bear to produce a placebo response. Now they form strong social and individual stereotypes. Again, that's a hallmark of how we're characterizing the bureaucratic mind. For example, Prozac is more effective in the United States than in Western Europe. And Valium is better in France and Belgium than the US. And here's where it gets fun. Blue pills are better than red pills for tranquilizers, placebo-type pills, except for an Italian men who associate blue with the national soccer team, so it kind of revs them up a little bit. <laughs> now, what's really interesting, Big Pharma has really got wind of this. They're studying it quite hard. And all of this goes into clinical, the geography of clinical trial selection to enhance the success rate of their trial. So, just a little. <laughs> so mind, meaning, and environment. The, pl the placebo response has been turned to meaning response. Meaning is learned. I tend to look at the placebo response as a learned response and meaning being part of that. But if you remember that search for meaning, it's not only part of the bureaucratic mindset, it's also part of Maslow's um, hierarchy. So the placebo response has now been validated by science in mainstream literature. What's happening? More people are becoming aware of it, more people are being educated to it. Enrolling that in a trial has an automatic effect. If you think, if a trial subject thinks they are in the placebo group, they are going to have a better response while taking placebo. The placebo response in trials is increasing. And what is really interesting is that even if you're being told you're given placebo, it doesn't matter. You're going to respond therapeutically to being told you're only being given placebo because people know of the power behind placebo now. So we get into the problem of metrics that we talked about briefly. It's like a, new, it's a frontier field. In terms of Bill Benson's project, the idea, um, it might produce an avenue of inquiry examining the psychological posture, his, the healer's posture, in relation to inter intentionality and how these parlay into healing. So the, our institute is, and um, our Beach Tree Labs, what John McMichael addressed yesterday, is approaching the problem via bioenergy. And so personally, and I'll, this is where I'll end this one, is I think Bill enters a meditative state. We've already dealt with that. He emits, depending upon how you model it, he emits a homeodynamic signal that produces the healing, or his consciousness in a psychological homeodynamic state is read by the healy, self-selects what is required out of that broadband signal, and the healing occurs. So that brings us into modeling which is an effect of the bureaucratic mind and produces the bureaucratic mind. And given that I have 30 seconds left, we'll end it there. So would anybody like to contribute? Thank you. Thank you, Ken. You ended it definitely early, so uh, we'll bring some people up. Julie? Really, really interesting. Um, thank you. Did you see my presentation? Pardon me? Did you see my presentation on I Thursday? I did, but I enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay, because um, I have a question related to that. Uh, 
in the mainstream literature, this connection between childhood trauma and physical disease, they, their um, proposed mechanism is, oh, trauma creates risky behaviors. Yeah. So the people become alcoholic and they, you know, yeah. they take risks. Um, do you think, I don't think that it at all, do you think that it could be this epigenetic methylation that's, that's turning trauma into disease? Based on what I've read, I, I would say, why not? Yeah. You, know, I mean, you have a, it's rooted in physiology now, and it brings in things such as you addressed, and it's relating it to things such as obesity, such as cancer, that have heretofore been thought of occurred from all these different variations, and they're going because a person inherited an epimutation, that inheritance produced the disease, no matter the structure of their actual DNA. Right. So I think it's really fascinating, and I, I would say, yeah. Yeah, be, because it's this psychological event, and it's creating yeah. this physical thing. So there yeah. has to be something physical, and I never, I didn't have an idea, but I think it might yeah. indeed be the methylation. So yeah, could thank be. you so much. Could be. You, yeah. you made my link in my hypothesis. Uh, go for it. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes, I'm an organizational sociologist, and basically have spent a fair amount of my adult life concentrating on the organizational climate. And I distinguish three. The one that you're mostly talking about is what I call a pathological climate. Mm -hmm. And it's typically characterized by leaders whose number one uh, interest is feathering their own nest. The pathological climate is often what people refer to as a toxic climate. Yeah. There's a wonderful book on this is called The No Asshole uh, <laughs> Policy. It's really interesting. The second one, the bureaucratic climate, yeah. has effects that are intermediate between that and the other one, what I call a generative climate. So I will give you a paper that I wrote. I have That'd several papers on this subject yeah, and so forth. Please do. But the interesting thing is that pathological climates typically produce physical illness. I mean, people literally get sick on the way to work. That's how you know you have a toxic environment. And it was one of my students who told me that his father was an auto worker, basically uh, had terrible problems just driving to work because he was so afraid of what was going to happen during the day. A generative climate tends to produce the opposite response. People are excited about the work they do. They're interested. They're energized and so forth. It's not terribly surprising that many of the high performance organizations have a generative climate. And I did a big study of the China Lake Naval Weapons Center, which interestingly enough had an extraordinarily generative climate. So if you're interested in this, I'll give you a paper. But anybody else is interested, I've got charts and things like that I'll give you. I'm, a, I'm very interested. Thank you for the paper. And B, thank you for presenting the flip side to the ill health part of it. Yeah. Well, but I, I see that the, the thing is, as you go from pathological to generative, there's a huge range of responses that are all, apparently all correlated. Yeah. Thank you. Ken, I'll take the last question. I have Oh, uh, yes. Uh, so I have two, two comments. One, I'd like to hear a little bit more about um, the environmental toxins in the, in the DNA. And secondly, even I found an old journal article talking about, from a French journal about 200 years ago, talked about legal medicine. And 50 years ago, a Cuban was saying, well, when you get to two together, disaster results. And um, so somebody preceded you on that one. Uh, no, I appreciate that. In terms of the environmental toxins, that's very interesting. Uh, BPAs, the chemicals that go into making all kinds of plastic, leach, they, it leaches into the water. So if you buy a bottle of water, you're getting BPAs. They are firmly established to producing epimutations. They have the research relating uh, BPAs to cancer is extensive. Um, there has been studies that show by driving in heavily exhaust areas on the road, Within seven days, your methylation patterns will change to an aberrant profile. Um, the, um, there's an assortment of toxins there environment, jet fuel. So if you're around an airport, you're exposing yourself that is known and documented to produce epimutations. So it is kind of a horrible thing, and that goes hand in hand with global warming, which again doesn't occur. The, um, and so the, the remedy to that, one remedy for the psychological state, they all work together, as was pointed out, is meditation. 
because meditation goes into, it's a de-automatization response, which by its very nature interdicts the bureaucratic mind kind of influence. Um, eat green leafy vegetables. <laughs> That's the single best thing you can do to help establish good DNA methylation patterns. And the other thing is work to have things such as environmental pollution change, because it is clearly an adverse physiologic event. It produces those events. So. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you for your time. All right. All right.